welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Today we are checking out a graphics card that I have been very keen to get my hands on, and it is the ASUS Tough Gaming RX 6800 XT. Now, some of you may recall the issues I exposed with the Tough Gaming 5700 series, issues that ultimately forced ASUS to discontinue that product line and replace it with the Tough Evo series featuring a complete redesign of the cooler. Since then, we have seen evidence that ASUS is paying careful attention to the cooling design of their newer graphics cards and making a number of improvements to the 5600 XT range with further improvements made to the Tough Gaming Ampere graphics cards. Now we have the 6800 XT model. So has ASUS truly learnt their lesson and avoided cutting corners on stuff like memory cooling? Well, let's go find out. I'm fairly confident that I can go out on a limb here and say that ASUS has learnt their lesson and that this tough gaming 6800 XT is going to be a beast. And that is purely based on a quick visual inspection of this graphics card while holding it. It is a uh, very, very heavy for a tough gaming graphics card. This thing weighs in at 1727 grams and that makes it 80% heavier than the 5700 XT version that I, um, that I ended up trashing. Quite shockingly, it's also 25% heavier than the excellent RTX 3080 Tough Gaming graphics card that I reviewed late last year. So it's heavy, even by high-end graphics card standards. Therefore, you won't be surprised to discover that it's also physically very large, measuring 320mm long, 140mm tall, and 58mm wide, making it a triple slot card. Design-wise, it is very similar to the RTX 3080 version, and as was the case with that model, I really like how there's no plastic on the card, apart from the fans, of course. And this means rather than use plastic, ASUS has constructed the fan shroud from aluminium, giving it a very premium look and feel. Also, as you'd expect, ASUS is using their Axial Tech fans, and since there are three in total, they've reversed the rotation of the outer fans to reduce turbulence. And the fans each measure 90 millimeters in diameter. I should also note that the card includes a fan stop feature, which activates when the GPU temperature drops below 55 degrees. Moving around to the back side of the card, we find a full length aluminium backplate, which features a few indentations behind the memory modules, or at least where they are located on the front side of the PCB. ASUS has done this to reduce the thickness of the thermal pads, which improves efficiency, and we'll look more at that in a moment. Then towards the end of the backplate is a cutout to aid in airflow. Overall, I have to say the backplate does look decent and the small tough gaming branding is tasteful enough. Actually, I do really like how this graphics card presents, especially from the outer facing edge. The Radeon branding is quite small and there's nothing else written on the side of the card. It's all very clean and the RGB tough logo towards the end of the card isn't over the top either. Then around at the IO end of the card, we find a single HDMI 2.1 port and three DisplayPort 1.4a outputs. So just a basic display output configuration. And I should note four DisplayPorts are supported simultaneously. As has been the case with all new ASUS graphics cards ever since the release of the Ampere range, they've again used a stainless steel IO bracket, which they say protects against rust while providing a more durable and secure mount. Okay, so that's a look around the card. Now it's time to pull this thing apart for a better look. Starting with the heatsink and fans, we have a very serious looking heatsink here. It's very large and very heavy, weighing in at 1222 grams. That's a massive cooler to include on a tough gaming graphics card. Surely the Strix version really can't be that much bigger, and hopefully that's something we'll check out another day. But getting back to that huge heatsink, it really is one massive heatsink that's not broken up by any heat pipes. Basically, ASUS has used 100% of the area available to cram in as many aluminium fins as possible. Of course, there are still a number of heat pipes. In fact, there are seven 6mm nickel-plated copper heat pipes that help transfer heat away from the base and into the many fins. All seven of these copper pipes are connected to a large nickel plated copper base, which cools the GPU along with the GDDR6 memory. Then ASUS has used an aluminium plate to cool the VRM components. There's also an aluminium brace or reinforced metal frame as ASUS calls it, which has been used to serve two purposes. Firstly, it's a strong support for the PCB, helping it avoid any bending under the weight of that massive cooler. And secondly, it's used to help extract heat from the VRM components. So quite an intricate design here from ASUS. On the back of the card, we find a rather thick aluminium backplate, which weighs 164 grams, and it's been used to strengthen the card and reduce PCB sag. 
or in this case, completely eliminate it. ASUS has also employed a series of thermal pads to remove built-up heat from the rear side of the PCB behind the VRM and GDDR6 memory chips. And then finally, there's also a few cutouts to aid in airflow. Now over to the PCB, we find a 277mm long by 140mm tall board, so those dimensions actually make it fairly compact, though it is crammed full of components. Of course, surrounding the massive 6800 XT die are the GDDR6 memory chips, and then flanking them on either side are boatloads of inductors and power stages. In total, the card packs 17 power stages, and here we're looking at a 14 plus 3 power phase design using Infineon's TDA 2147270 amp power stages. There are also two 8-pin PCIe power connectors feeding power into the graphics card, and you'll also find a dual BIOS switch that allows you to change from the default performance BIOS to a quiet BIOS. Now, in terms of clock specifications, ASUS lists a core clock frequency of 2340 MHz, which is a 4% boost over the 2250 MHz default spec. Of course, the GDDR6 memory has been left at 16 gigabits per second, so we're just looking at a typical mild GPU overclock here. All that said, let's move on to see what clock speeds this model maintains under load. For testing, I'm using Shadow of the Tomb Raider and reporting the temperature after 30 minutes of gameplay. This saw the Tough Gaming peak at 82 degrees for the hotspot and just 65 degrees for the edge temperature in a 21 degree room inside the Corsair Obsidian 500D, fully populated with fans. That is a massive 10 degree drop in temperature when compared to the AMD reference model. Now in order to maintain this temperature, the fans spun at up to 1850 RPM, and while that is a reasonably high fan speed, the card was surprisingly quiet, generating just 41 decibels of noise. The typical core clock speed seen during our testing was 2260 MHz, and this saw power consumption increase by 7% from the 297 watts of the AMD reference model up to 317 watts for the tough gaming. Now for overclocking, with the limits reached, we again saw a peak operating temperature of just 69 degrees for the edge temp and 90 degrees for the hotspot, and this time the fan spun at up to 2200 RPM. Again, it wasn't terribly loud at this fan speed. The overclock saw the cores operate at 2.66 GHz, and the memory also hit 17.1 gigabits per second, so pretty impressive transfer speed there. Though I should note that both the core and memory overclocks have been limited by AMD, that is artificially limited. The card could technically or really should overclock higher than this, but these are the limits enforced by AMD. So quite disappointing there on AMD's behalf, but this is what they have chosen to do with all of their RDNA 2 GPUs. And finally, when overclocked, the card sucked down 366 watts, so just a 15% increase from the stock factory OC configuration. And just finally, please note that I'm still using my AMD Ryzen 9 3950X test system for testing these AIB graphics cards, though I am transitioning to the 5950X for all of our other GPU testing. And this system uses 32GB of DDR4-3200 memory. The latest drivers available at the time of testing have been used, and for this one we have just a few select benchmarks to look at. Here's a quick look at FPS performance in Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 1440p. Out of the box, the Tough Gaming is just a percent faster than the AMD reference model, making it less than a frame slower than the Power Color Red Devil. So in other words, very typical stock performance. Through manual overclocking, I was able to boost performance by a further 8%, not quite as good as the Red Devil, but still a solid result overall. The margins are also much the same at 4K. Here the manual overclock boosted performance by 9% to 88 FPS, again making the Tough Gaming just a few frames slower than the Red Devil. As for power consumption, the Tough Gaming isn't quite as efficient as the AMD reference model, though it is comparable to the Red Devil and Speeds to Merc for example. Overclocking increased power usage by 15%, and now the Tough Gaming was sucking down 366 watts. Here's a look at the GPU edge temperatures out of the box using the stock fan profile, so these results don't take the operating volume into account. This is just how they perform by default. As you can see out of the box, the Tough Gaming performs very well, thanks to the 1850 RPM fan speed, which kept the edge temp at 65 degrees, which is 7 degrees cooler than the Red Devil and 8 degrees cooler than the Nitro Plus. The hotspot temperatures are also very good, peaking at just 82 degrees, which is a 9 degree reduction from what we saw with the Speeds to Merc, Red Devil and Nitro Plus. It's also a 12 degree reduction when compared to the AMD reference model. 
The VRM temperatures out of the box are also very good, peaking at just 63 degrees, which is 3 degrees cooler than the Speedster Merc and 5 degrees cooler than the Red Devil. That said, all models, including the reference card, ran the VRM at very cool, very safe operating temperatures. The stock memory temperature was quite shocking really, just 56 degrees for the peak with the tough gaming. Clearly that larger copper base plate is working wonders here, as that is a 6 degree reduction when compared to the Red Devil. Now, accounting for the operating volume by noise normalizing these graphics cards, we find that the GPU edge temperature is 66 degrees for the tough gaming, and that placed it on par with the Red Devil, and just a degree cooler than the Nitro Plus and AMD reference model. It was also just 3 degrees hotter than the Speedster Merc, which is the best performing air-cooled model that I've reviewed to date. That said, if we look at the hotspot temperatures, the Tough Gaming does match the speeds to Merc at 83 degrees, along with the Red Devil, so performance is very similar when comparing the various air-cooled models. However, there is considerably more variation in the VRM temperatures, though the Tough Gaming again performed very well, peaking at just 63 degrees. Again, it was just a degree cooler than the Red Devil, but as noted in the stock testing, all these results are very acceptable and well within safe operating parameters. Then lastly, we have the GDDR6 memory temperatures, and again, the Tough Gaming performed exceptionally well, and in fact was the coolest of the air-cooled 6800 XTs here, peaking at just 57 degrees. So there you have it. The ASUS Tough Gaming RX 6800 XT is a very impressive graphics card. Of course, the only bad news right now being availability, as all 6800 series products are virtually non-existent. As a result, the bulk of the comments in this video will no doubt be from people complaining about the lack of stock, and that's okay. We certainly get it, and we're also extremely frustrated. For this reason, I've only provided a maximum of one AIB graphics card review per week, and for the past month have turned away dozens of offers for samples of new products, some of which sounded quite interesting, but we're also not looking to flood the channel with products you can't buy right now. That said, given how the 5700 XT review went, the Tough Gaming RX 6800 XT was one product I simply couldn't turn away. I was extremely intrigued to see what ASUS had done here, and I'm happy to report that they've done a great job this time around. Unfortunately, as good as the Tough Gaming model may be, you're unlikely to get your hands on one anytime soon, and worse still is the price. Here in Australia, the recommended retail price for a base model 6800 XT is $1,050 AUD, and the cheapest models I've come across, such as Power Colors Red Dragon, cost $1,330 AUD, so a hefty 30-ish percent over the base price. But of course, that's what we've come to expect in early 2021. The problem though with the Tough Gaming isn't that it commands a 30% premium, but rather that it's 60% over the recommended retail price in Australia, and that's not retailers price gouging, rather that is the recommended price set by ASUS. Incredibly, that's not far off what we were paying for an RTX 2080 Ti over a year ago. So it's a depressing scenario for buyers that's been caused by global shortages, and things unfortunately are only set to get worse. So there's basically no chance you'll land one of these anywhere near AMD's MSRP anytime soon. And on that bombshell, I'm going to end this video. If you did enjoy this review of the Tough Gaming RX 6800 XT, then please do give it a like and subscribe for more content. As I said, I'm not going to be doing a whole heap of graphics card reviews. I'll be doing about one a week. Don't want to yeah, flood the uh, channel with that kind of content. We'll be doing some other benchmark videos and Tim will have some other content, of course. So yeah, make sure you're subscribed. Uh, also, if you'd like to join the Harbour Unbox community, then you can do so over at Patreon or Floatplane. The links for both of those are in the video description. Get access to monthly live streams, Discord servers, behind the scenes content, Q&As, a lot of cool stuff there. So check it out if you're interested. If not, perfectly fine. And I would like to just thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve. And I'll see you again next time.